this freedom though you captured me Down deep in my soul, sinner, you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. There's beauty, there's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love, I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, there's freedom. From my eyes, tears from my eyes in hell. 
sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. Good morning. Hello, everyone. We're so glad that you could join us for our online worship this morning. For those of you who don't know us, my name is Dan Therian, and this is my lovely wife, Michal. <laughs> uh, so just this past week, we were on vacation in Maine. Um, you know, both McCall and myself, we grew up in Massachusetts. So we grew up vacationing in Maine, Cape Cod, um, other places around New England. I think one of the main takeaways from the week was just the the new perspective that we gained from the trip. Um, I think about, you know, visiting the same locations again, um, the same beaches, maybe even just the same body of water. Each time, you know, offers the, the opportunity to really have a different and unique experience. Uh, maybe it's the way that the fish are hitting the surface or you know, birds are in the air. Maybe it's just the way the, the light's reflecting off the water. Um, you know, this idea really inspires me to the way we can approach God's word um, and meetings at the body, even though we meet regularly, um, even though that we're in scripture, you know, God gives us the chance uh, to really see him in a new light um, each and every time. So I'm going to give it over to McCall and then have her share. Good morning, church. I'm first going to start off with a scripture. So in Psalm 25, 5, it reads, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. This scripture has been a great reminder for me this week. With everything that's going on between the pandemic and the racial issues that can occur in this country, it can leave my heart and emotions feeling so unsettled. 
Um, this time has been referred to as a corona coaster. In that one moment, I might feel at ease and calm and peaceful. And in the next, my heart is full of fear and anxiety as I just look to um, teaching in the fall amidst all of the uncertainty. This scripture reminds me um, to seek God for understanding, to remain teachable and faithful in a time where I'm tempted to let my emotions lead. In the same way that we can visit a body of water and gain a new experience or renewed refreshment, it's my hope that for this morning, we're able to open our hearts to see God in new ways. Dan's going to pray for us. God, thank you for uh, just this time this morning to, to focus on you. God, I pray that you can uh, just help us put aside, you know, the distractions from the week, mm -hmm. um, distractions that we may still have this morning, um, just to, to put that aside and, and focus on you this morning, God. Um, we're, we're thankful for the, the technology that allows us to, you know, communicate with one another, God, um, to have these services um, to, to worship you. Um, God, I pray that you can help open our hearts, God. Help us open our eyes to your word. Um, I pray that you allow us this morning to, you know, see you in a new light, see you with a new perspective, God, um, and, and gain new understanding with that. God, I pray that, you know, the, the sermon can impact each and every one of us um, and that uh, we, we each can take something away from it um, and really apply it into our lives moving forward, God. Uh, we pray for the service this morning, God. We love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker. Everybody say, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker, way maker, miracle worker. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Oh, 
Church, how are we doing today? It's great to be together, even virtually. So I've got some announcements for us, and I'm just going to go ahead and read through those real quick. It says, the leadership team would like to give the church an update on multiple fronts. During this time, communication is so important, and knowing where we are and where we'd like to go is vital. So number one, we have organized a team of brothers and sisters to determine the best ways moving forward to possibly meet together again safely. The team is led by Tom Heaton and has many members that have different areas of specialization. Number two, and you're gonna see this today, the teacher's ministry is going to kick off a series all about the Gospel of Matthew. And so they're encouraging us to read through the Gospel of Matthew to prepare for this series that they're gonna be doing on Wednesdays and Sundays. Number three, our new world of virtual worship has been good for some, and we understand that it has been very hard for others. Virtual worship, Zoom calls, even phone calls will never give us the same experience as when we're together. We are asking each brother and sister to persevere along with us as we go through this unique time. We pray that it shortens and that we can be back together safely soon. In the meantime, please stay connected on Sundays and Wednesdays. Reach out to one another during the week. If you have any questions or would like to share your thoughts, we would like to hear them. Please contact a member of the leadership team for clarity or just for expressing your concern. We are a family and we want to keep lines of communication open. And lastly, uh, the fourth announcement is about midweek. This week, midweek is by small group. So reach out to your small group and see what you guys are doing for the week. And if you're new and you're not part of a small group with our church, please reach out to us, contact us, send us a message. We'd love to get you connected. Amen. Love you guys. Hi, my name is David Merck, and this is the part of our service where we focus on the heart of giving. Uh, there's a church that Paul addresses in the Bible that was praised for its giving, yet it was going to be called upon to give again. And he felt the need to send brothers ahead to make sure that they were set up for success in their giving. And that's kind of what this part of the service is about. Is It's about preparing our hearts in such a way that what we give is commendable to God. And Paul goes on to adjust, address this church. And he talks about remembering. And the first thing that we do when we give is we need to remember. We need to remember why we're giving. And Paul uh, calls it the indescribable gift. 
That's why we give. We give because of the indescribable gift that's been given to us. And in all things, at all times, uh, he says that we can be generous on every occasion, that we can abound in every good work, enriched in every way, can be generous on every occasion, overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Uh, I know for myself that it's particularly challenging after you've given and you're given, you know, an opportunity presents itself where you are asked to give again. Uh, or, or maybe um, you're challenged on, on who you give to. Uh, a lot of times I, I want to give to people that can give back to me. And that's not even giving. That, that's exchanging, really. Uh, what, what the Bible challenges us to do is to give to those who can't possibly give back to us. Uh, where we're giving them a gift that they can't possibly return to us. And that's what, that's what uh, Paul talks about when he talks about a harvest of righteousness as the reward. That that's the true wealth, is the harvest of righteousness. You know, how we give determines uh, the possibility of that harvest of righteousness. So are we giving begrudgingly? Or are we remembering the indescribable gift? Let's give with all our hearts. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for all that you've given us. Uh, God, thank you for the indescribable gift of your love and how it was demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. Uh, your love is beyond our, our description. It's uh, beyond anything that we can fathom. And yet uh, the closest that we have is, is a man dying for us so that we could live. Uh, God, thank you so much for instilling us with your spirit, uh, giving us the energy and the willingness um, to serve others around us uh, as you exemplified through your son. Uh, we love you. We consider it a great honor to be able to give in your name. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hello, my name is Sajin. I am uh, the evangelist and elder here in the Pioneer Valley Church of Christ. It is great to be together. I am so excited about a new series we're starting. We're starting a series on the, on the Gospel of Matthew. And I believe there couldn't be a better time to have this r than, than right now. It is a great, great Gospel. Obviously, anything within Scripture is going to be great, but it's, I think, specific to our time right now what we're going through as a nation what we're going through as a church and and i believe where god would like for us to mature in and grow up in and so i'm, I'm really excited about it. this has been on my heart for about six months and uh, i'm excited to, to see what god is going to do so we as a church have a choice right now at this moment uh, and that choice is we can lament the, the things that we have lost. And we have lost a lot. I, I think about the seniors. Uh, the seniors just in high school, they've lost their prom, they've lost their, uh, their, fall, their spring sports, their fall sports this upcoming uh, semester possibly. They've lost uh, trips that they were supposed to take, lost so much. Uh, others have lost uh, even more severe things in terms of family and relatives and the capacity to be able to connect and and say goodbye there's been there's been such a time of loss we have lost so much we've lost the opportunity as a church to meet together and and i feel that i feel that and i i would say this i would say this i would say that right now more than ever we have a choice to make about being able to give and being able to contribute and being able to stay connected it's no longer up to other people's to connect with to other people's jobs to connect with us. Now, really the otis of responsibility as a result of what's going on globally is us having to engage and take those extra steps that may be necessary. I know virtual worship can be challenging, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to figure out a way to connect with others. There are some people who are on virtual worship, they're amening, they're making comments, there's others who don't want that, uh, there's others who look at names and, 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 and decide that's who they're gonna call that week. I'm not sure what it is for you, but please, we can lament, and, and I think appropriately so, about all the things we've lost. 
Um, and some of us, we, we should be grieving at some of the things we've lost. But I believe God has given us this opportunity to connect in this way, this responsibility to connect in this way. So let's do so. Let's make this just an absolutely great worship for our hearts. As a church, just for you guys to know, we believe that this is not a lecture. We believe that this is not a time to be entertained. We believe that the word of God is to be spoken and that we can be transformed as, as, the, as the moment comes to us. But really, the choice is up to us. What's the difference between a lecture and, and, and hearing God's word? It's taking in that information, taking in that knowledge, and going and living it out to the best of our abilities. That's the difference. What's the difference between entertainment and, and, and church? Entertainment's not bad. It makes us laugh. It lightens our mood. That's good. But what does church do? It, it, it lightens us. It, it perhaps does make us laugh with the intent to be able to connect with those that are around us virtually in this setting. And so let's do it. Let's make it happen. Let's not make this a lecture. Let's not make this a time of being entertained, but let us make this God's word speaking to our hearts. Let's make a decision. We're gonna find one thing that God is speaking to us in today that we're gonna go do uh, this week and really make different in our lives. So as we start the study, of the Gospel of Matthew, there's something really important for us to know. Romans 8 says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Listen to what the scripture says here. It's so very powerful. It's stating a fact that when your mind is focused on things of the flesh, when it's focused on the things of this world, the end result, when it's governed by it is what the Bible says, it ends in death. But when the mind is governed by the spirit, there is life and peace. This is what I would want to say to us as we go into the book uh, of Matthew. And this is what we're going to do for this entire service here. And that is learn how to get our minds governed by the spirit. Learn how to look at the gospel of Matthew differently than perhaps we've looked at the gospel of Matthew in the past. So I just got, I just got glasses. Um, actually, I didn't get them just recently. It was a little bit ago. I think it's almost a year now. And since I've got my lenses, uh, there's trifocals. And I, there's one part where I see distance, one part where I see up close. And what I have to do is I intentionally, depending on what I'm reading, have to change the lens I'm using because that allows my mind to pick up the information. It, it determines what I'm going to be uh, thinking about. And so the way that you, the lens that you use to read the Gospel of Matthew is going to determine what, what governs your mind? Will it be things of the flesh or things of the spirit? I would, I would desire that it be things of the spirit. So what is the lens we're going to use? What is the lens that, that we collectively, as we move forward, are going to use? And that lens is actually a Hebrew word called mumzer. It can be spelled M-U-M-Z-E-R or M-A-M-Z-E-R. And this is a term used for an offspring of what would be considered an illegitimate or an illegal marriage in the time of the Hebrew nation. And so uh, this would be a time where perhaps a, a woman was married to a Greek man. Uh, the, the, the offspring would be considered a mumser. It's, it's something that isn't necessarily taken in by uh, the, 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 the priests and, 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 and uh, the, the ruling principles at the time as being legitimate at a social level. And so mumsers were considered kind of the outcasts. Um, and we're going to use it as in that, in that sense, that mumsers are those that are not in the inner circle. So every society, every social system has a norm. Right? They do. They do. Every social, uh, every, every society has what we would call a norm. Now that norm, that norm can be something like, uh, like a white, uh, a house with a white picket fence, a two car garage and a, and a, and a dog. The idea is that once we have that, we have arrived. 
That is the norm. That is what we should be striving for. That is what we should be going for. Now, the problem with these social norms is we're subjective creatures. There's things we like. Suppose we don't like picket fences. Suppose we don't like houses. Well, what if we want a condo? What if we want an apartment? What if we never want to pr buy anything and we want to rent? Well, what if? What if we want to live in an RV? Well. We're subjective creatures. We have different sets of experiences. And what begins to happen is some of, the, some of those experiences take us to the outskirts of society. They make us what, 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 the, what we'll use as the term mumsers, outsiders. Uh, and and that, yeah, that can be true at so many different levels. So think about society. Society's norm is, is both you know concrete in a, in a moment uh, where it has to be a certain way, but it can also be fluid over time. So what, you, what, what is considered normal today is not considered normal uh, next year or 10 years. Like think about the concept of female beauty. Female beauty has one idea and one concept today, which I think is both illogical, irrational, and unhealthy. Uh, the kind of what we, what, what the society calls norm. But if you go back uh, a couple couple hundred years, a hundred years, what was considered norm then was very different. What was very different. And, and so what I'd like for us to understand is that society around us declares something normal and that those on the outskirts are the mumsers. So in Jesus's time, when the Gospel of Matthew uh, was, was writing about, there was a, a, a religious norm. This, there was a way of being. And, and what we'll learn as we read through the Gospel of Matthew is that he was speaking specifically about the kingdom of God in relative to the mumser. See, the, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, thought that only an Israelite, uh, that an Israelite, well, a particular way, could be a particular thing, would be included in, in the community. And yet, what we learn with Matthew is, whoa, 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 that's not quite true, is it? With Matthew, what we know about Matthew is that he was a tax collector. What does that mean? That means he was highly intelligent, he had to be very good with numbers. He had to be very good with arithmetic and the ability to count and keep track of things. We also know that he had to make a choice. Now, we don't know the entire story, but we know he chose to leave the Hebrew society and join up with the Romans. And, when, and he did that possibly because he didn't feel like the, the norm that was there was providing what he needed. And so he went and he tried to just make his fortune. He tried to make his, 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 uh, his money. And, and, and he felt the, uh, being ostracized, being minimized, being spat upon, being uh, looked away from by the people that were around him. He, he, he experienced directly being a mumser, being the outsider with his people. So who in scripture would fall into the category of being a mumser. What would that be? What would that be? Um, let's turn, let's look at a few examples. We're going to look at a few examples from the Old Testament. And so um, let's turn to Genesis chapter 29. We're going to read verses 14 to 18. And so this is a story about two sisters, an older sister and a younger sister. And we're going to look and we're going to try to determine who is the mumser and why? Why? What made her the mumser? Now, for those of us who are turning our Bibles uh, there or who have about, perhaps already arrived there, I'd like for you to throw in the comments someone that you see within Scripture that was an outsider, someone that was a mumser, somebody that was, didn't fit the social norms, uh, that was outside, that was perhaps not the dominant culture of the time. Uh, write it down. And so this could be in a town, it could be in a city, it could be in a nation, it could even as we're about to see, being a family. All right, let's look. So in Genesis chapter 29, verse 14. So what is happening here is Jacob has run away from his family and he's taken up some time with a relative named Laban. Now Laban has two, uh, two daughters. One of them, the do younger daughter, is absolutely beautiful. Her name is Rachel and she catches Jacob's eyes. And so Jacob is at a point where he approaches Laban and asks for her hand in marriage. 
Let's read just this description. And we, we, if we know the story, we know what ends up happening to the outsider here. It says in verse 14, Then Laban said to him, You are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, the, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Now, there's really something very insightful that we read in scripture here. There are two sisters. One of them is Rachel, one of them is Leah. And one, what we see right away is that one of them is the mumser. One of them is on the outskirts. And what makes her on the outskirts? It's it's not her it's not her place in in the lineage with with her so she's the older daughter she should get more respect she should get uh things first she should be more esteemed uh because there's they've had perhaps the relationship the longest but what does it say what does it say it says leah had weak eyes um, and what we what we see here, especially when we put it right next to the statement that's made about Rachel, um, and uh, but but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful, and so they think this was a this was a term in in the Israelite Hebrew perspective for someone that was perhaps not super attractive on the outside, and so Leah was not super attractive on the outside. Rachel was beautiful. And so Rachel is one of those people who oh, smiles and doors go open. And that, that was just what she was. And, and so what we see here is that even her father, who uh, we know the end of the story, he tricks Jacob and he has Jacob uh, drink, get intoxicated, and then go and marry Leah, and then has him work for another seven years to marry Rachel. And we know the, the, the pain that ends up in this family uh, for Jacob and for Rachel and for for Leah it's it's catastrophic but where does it start it starts with a favorite it starts with a mumser it starts with an individual wanting one over another, uh, one, one being on the outskirts, one being on the inside. So Jacob, of course, he's getting married. He's, he's, he's allowed to make those choices as he wants to, um, whether it was the best choice or not. We can debate that, but it's really their father that I would talk about, their father here in society. And I think this is what can happen in our families. We can feel like the outsider. We can feel like, and, and we're not sure what exactly can cause that. In this particular case, I think it was because Rachel was so beautiful and Leah perhaps was not. And we see that immediately that physical difference created, an, uh, created a favoritism, it created a bias, it, it, cre it took things a different direction. And she experienced, Leah experienced the life of a mumser. Even married to Jacob, it was very obvious. There were favorites between the two. And, and what do we see? If you read the story, and we've had a few more scriptures to read, so I'll let you go ahead and do that here. But what we see is that Rachel was deeply loved by Jacob. And, and perhaps it was more of an obligation with, with Leah. But we see Leah carry on, really, the lion's portion of Jacob's lineage have the children we see that which is very valued in that time which was considered a direct blessing by god what do we see we see even in this situation the mumser being being looked upon by god and making sure that she's not forgotten leah is not forgotten but she's on the outskirts. So, uh, the, she, so she's one example. She's one example. So we got Leah as a mumser. And, and, and this might apply to you. You may feel that in your family. You may feel that uh, in, your, in your classroom. You may feel that in life. Let me tell you, I think all of us feel it. I feel it all the time. I'm too tall, which is actually more rare than you would think. I'm too short. I'm too this. I'm too brown. I'm too... I, I, whatever it might be, we feel it. We feel this thing that separates us from the norm. Why? Because the norm is impossible to achieve. 
It's impossible. And that's why all of us feel insecure. All of us deep down inside, no, we don't fit into that. We don't fit into that society. We'll never fit perfectly into it. And we're, we're, we're looking for a space. We're looking for a place. That's what, the, that's what the Gospel of Matthew is about. The Gospel of Matthew is a statement to all Jews that this is not just for you, but really, really, the kingdom of God is for the mumsers. It's for the men and women who are on the outskirts. Bring them in. Pull them in. And we see Paul, when he, when he converted to Christianity, he embraced Matthew's Gospel. And he went to the Gentiles, who were the ultimate mumsers in that time, and brought them in. But that's another, that's another story. But Leah is a great example of what a mumser can look like. She was Israelite. She was the older child. She had almost everything going for her, and yet one attribute made her uh, this, this particular, and it was physical. It was physical. And this, it did that in the family. Now there's another example. Let's turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll read verses 1 through 12. All right? So here we go. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will, they mourn, how long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint you are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. When they met him, they said, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, this is a very powerful statement about how much God's word was feared and, and respected at the time. Those were the elders uh, who, who had Samuel, who represented God's word, uh, kind of came in. And uh, that's a challenge directly to my heart. Amen. Um, uh, uh, Samuel did what the Lord said when he arrived in Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled. And when they met him, they, they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate your yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you, did you hear that? Did you hear that? The world looks at the outside. And if you think about the norms, that's so much of what determines what social norms are, what determines who is in the in crowd and who is in the out crowd, who is the, the insider and who is the mumser. It's the, it's the appearance, it's the, it's, the, it's the features, it's the color of the skin, it's the height, it's the amount of hair. It's a, so many different factors can determine it. Let's keep reading. It says, Then Jesse called Abinadab and, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen thee. So he asked Jesse, Are these all your sons? Really important. So here we are. We saw the elders of the town who, who were panicking when they saw Samuel. He enters Jesse's house. He's going to appoint one of his children, uh, the king of Israel. And, and what does Jesse do? What does Jesse do? He brings all of his son except one. Except one. The other one is on the outskirts. He's tending the sheep. He's not even mentioned. Now, of course, we could look at it and say, hey, he's just, Jesse's just being responsible. But what I note about this is Jesse doesn't even mention David. Doesn't even mention him. It's, it's, really, it's really Samuel who has to bring it up. He says, are these all that you have? You know, by the time he got to the last one, as a father, you're going, wait, abandon that. Go get David. Bring David here. Maybe he's the one. That's what a father does, right? But what we see is a dynamic, a dynamic of, of, of there being a mumser. David was on the outskirts, perhaps forgotten, perhaps minimized. I'm not sure. But he says, there is still the youngest. Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. 
Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint. This is the one. Oh my goodness. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, this is the transformation that is being demanded as we read through the Gospel of Matthew. Every single page from, from, the, uh, from, from the first chapter to the last, it's about the mumsers. It's about bringing them in. It's, it juxtaposes the, the lineage of, 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 of people next to one another, showing, even in Jesus' lineage, the, the, the people that were considered outcasts, the stories that people would want to hide. They're highlighted in the genealogy of Christ. Why? Because there's a statement being made by God it's the same statement he makes with Leah. It's the same statement he makes with David. It's the same statement he makes over and over and over again throughout history. It is those on the outskirts. It is those that are on the outside that need to be pulled in. And who does the pulling in? It's the people who would, we would call on the inside. It's the ones who perhaps are a little more accepted or who fit the social norms. That's the call. That's as we read through the book of Genesis, as we read through the book of Exodus, as we read through the Gospels, we see this over and over, this call for, for God to look at the mumsers in the world and want them pulled in. As we read through the Gospel of Matthew, this is the challenge for us. The challenge for us is for us to see that we have so much yet to learn, that our hearts are not about just taking care of those who are like us. Rather, it's going into the world and being with those who are not and, and bringing them in. We don't lower standards. We don't lower convictions. We don't do that. So please understand that. There is convictions that are to be had. You know, the Bible says, if a brother won't work, don't feed him. And there's, we're not contradicting, but there's a character issue with the brother that's there. And what we see is something much more general, an ideology that God wants all of his people to have. Who's the underdog? Who's the one on, on, on the bottom? Who's the one who needs the help? They are who I am sending you to. Go! Go! We read throughout scriptures, we read about mumsers. Timothy was one. Paul what becomes one. He was the ultimate insider that becomes the ultimate going out to the outskirts and bringing them in. We, we read this, the scriptures over and over and it all revolves around this idea of God pulling in those who are on the outside. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why that God is pulling in the outsiders. Because that's what all of us are. No matter what you think, that's what all of us are. We may have created a little, little space in our corner of the universe where we feel like we are all normal, but the truth is, this is not the world we're supposed to be living in. This is broken. It's groaning. We are outsiders. We are craving something much fuller. We are craving much more. And that is a relationship with God. We are all outsiders. We are all mumsers. If you think you got it together, if you think you know, then we're in trouble. We've got to realize we are all mumsers. When we do that, our capacity to engage with those around us with compassion and empathy and love and true understanding increases 10 times. If we decide we're going to hold on to our own corner of the universe, will never build God's kingdom. We will build only ours. We will build only ours. In this series, we're going to talk about the mumsers in the Bible. We're going to talk about the orphans. We're going to talk about the widows, the Samaritans. We're going to talk about the poor and needy. We're going to talk about those that have injustice uh, placed upon them. We want, we want to have these conversations. That's what this lens does. As we read through the Gospel of Matthew, we start reading over and over this, uh, the highlighting, the understanding that God's kingdom is for those, all of us, but it's especially drawn, drawing in the mumsers. Now, this is 
where I think Christianity now goes ahead and deviates from every other religion in the world, every other philosophy in the world, every other theology in the world is right here at this moment in time. Because there's a lot of philosophies that want that you know they're 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 vying for the underdog, they're fighting for uh, for the one that can't speak for themselves, and I think that's right, that's good. But this is where it's different. This is where Christianity takes a right turn. The ultimate insider, the ultimate person who lived in what should be normal, became a mumser for us. In Matthew chapter 1, what we witness is something just incredible. So what do we know about what the word mumser is? Mumser is, you know, a, a child born of an illegal, not necessarily illicit, just a, a non-sanctioned marriage, according to the Hebrew uh, customs, traditions, and, and, and community. And, and perhaps there could be no more of a mumser than, than the man who came down to earth to die for us. See, he could have been born to, to any other couple out there, but who is he born to? Joseph and Mary. They're engaged, so they fulfill the law technically, but they haven't necessarily been intimate. And, and Mary comes back pregnant, and it, it can seem like it's from an illicit, an unsanctioned, and uh, unrighteous human carnal relationship, and yet it was so much more. It was from the Holy Spirit. God worked, and what did what ended up happening? Jesus went from being a king on a throne, living in a in a universe that followed all of His commands, safe painless and he came and he was he was born to a teenage girl and he was born a mumser matthew 1 verse 18 in matthew 1 sorry i thought i'd turn there in matthew 1 Verse 18, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This is where Christianity takes a right turn from every other philosophy in the world. Every other philosophy theology will tell you that's the right thing to do. Only Jesus comes down and does it first. He comes down, he leaves, he isn't, he could have been born a king, he could have been born on a human th throne, and yet he is born in a stable to a teenage girl, he's born a mumser. And he does that, he does that for you and I. The ultimate insider reaching out to, to us, the outcasts, the broken ones, the ones that have never really felt like we belonged anyway. The ultimate insider stepping away from that crowd, approaching us, and putting his arms around us. That's what Christianity is. We take communion right now, and its purpose is very clear. Its purpose is to remember the, the sacrifice that Jesus made. He came to live on this planet, a, pa a planet of, of, of sin, hatred, a planet that was hostile to his very being. And yet he did it willingly. We do, we take communion to remember the blood, the blood that was spilled, to remember him separate, uh, stretching out his arms, allowing the nails to come through, allowing himself to be killed by the Roman soldiers, the creator being put to death by the created. He allowed it. And why? So that you and I would have a chance 
so that you and I could go from being mumsers to being in God's kingdom. And being in God's kingdom isn't like being in the in crowd at high school. It's not like that where you just become mean yourself. When you're on the inside with God, all you think about is pulling in more, reaching out to the poor, reaching out to the disenfranchised, letting them know about the good news that they don't have to be outsiders everywhere, that there is a place where they are fully accepted. And that is God's kingdom. Let us, let us take this time. Let us bow our heads. Let us pray for communion. Father, as we think about you and who you are, we think about the cross and the ultimate statement of your love for us. As Father, you stretched out your hands and permitted the nails to go through, as you stopped the angels from coming down and, and striking down the Roman soldiers, as Father, you permitted death itself to wash over you. Father, we remember your sacrifice. Help, Father, this communion to be a time of internal transformation. Help us, Father, if we think we're insiders, to be awakened to the understanding that, Father, we are not. That if we think we know all that you have to tell us, that we don't. And that, Father, we have so much more to learn and grow in as we get closer, Father, to the cross. I pray that, Father, this communion will give us compassion and empathy, not because of the, of, the, of the condition of those around us. But Lord, because of what you did for us, help us, Father, to be sensitive to those that, Father, are around us and perhaps do not have a voice, do not have a say, have had justice go against them. Please, Lord, help us, Father, as we study through the book of Matthew for our hearts to be deeply changed.
主跟我曾同到困苦的百事，我主拯救，永远亦伴我在旁世间的真挚，随年月永不变，在这刻只知道要快步求告主，愿我主与我同，失落时与我同，我孤独时与我同。我或是我向主祷告，与我同；失落时，与我同；我孤独时，与我同；跟主祷告，主生与我同行。我主应允，共同让我可出走我心的魔鬼，困难接受得释放，我亦当自由，神是万有主。失落时，与我同；我孤独时，与我同；我或是主必向主祷告，与我同。失落时，与我同；我孤独时，与我同。跟主祷告，主必与我同。你差遣我是跟十架的。我孤独时，与我同；欢乐时，我向主祷告，与我同；失落时，与我同；我孤独时，与我同；跟主祷告，主一生与我同行，与我同行，与我同行，主必并肩与我同。失落时，与我同；我孤独时，与我同。
Yes!